Welcome. Happy Sabbath. I'm glad to see you here this morning. Uh, I want to welcome those joining us online today. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Chris. I'm the assistant pastor here at Shepherd's Fold. Mm -hmm. I am happy to be here with you this morning, or at least be here with you digitally. Um, as you can see, I'm not there personally. I recorded this ahead of time, but I am happy to bring you the message today. So uh, welcome to my office. Pull up a seat, get out your Bible, and let's get going. So this morning, um, I want to take you to the book of Luke. That's what we're going to do. Um, this passage that we're going to look at this morning, this, this series of verses, hit me like a, a football player driving into the ground. Uh, I was tackled by them. I was, uh, I was actually quite ripped by them, really. And uh, you may be like, really? These gripped you? But by the end, I promise, uh, well, at least I hope, you will be gripped by them too. Um, and you will see what God has laid on my heart today, and hopefully he's laid on yours as well. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 9, verse 18. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to turn there with me. Um, while you're turning there, I want to uh, just introduce you to the book a little bit, the background. Um, as I always say, it's important to know who it was written to, written by, and why for, what it was written for, right? So um, Luke was not an apostle. He was a disciple um, of, of Jesus, not during his earthly ministry, we don't think. Um, we believe he was a, a student of Paul, and he we see that in Acts is when he joins Paul on this mission. That's not when he became a Christian, but that's when he was picked up and became part of the story of the New Testament, what we see. Um, Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. And both are dedicated to the same person. They're actually dedicated to somebody. So I just want to take a second before we get into this morning and uh, look at chapter 1, verse 1. I'll read it. Um, it says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of, thing, of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus or Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you've been taught. So Luke is writing to a person for a purpose. His purpose is that this person has heard about Jesus. He's heard about his life, death, and resurrection. And uh, Luke wants to make sure that he has certainty about those things he's been taught. Luke also acknowledges that there's other accounts compiled of Jesus' life and uh, possibly the things that are going on in Acts uh, because he also wrote that book. Um, he says the things that have been accomplished among us, which is including himself, and then he talks about those who were eyewitnesses uh, delivered what they've written down to them as well. So Luke is writing uh, first the gospel, the life of Jesus, so that this guy can know who Jesus was with certainty. The things that were taught to him are true. Uh, so as we read our, the book of Luke, realize that this book was written for people like you and me who are believers sitting in the chairs today. Uh, this, is, this is to confirm that what you've heard about Jesus is true. But we don't know exactly who this Theophilus or Theophilus was. We can infer that by the use of most excellent that he was some kind of governor or some kind of public official, and again, we believe he was a, a new Christian. Um, he's included in the us when Luke writes, the things that were delivered to us, the things that have been passed on to us. Um, so he is new to the faith, probably, and Luke is trying to encourage him, and disciple him, and give him uh, an orderly account, as it is said. So Luke is very detail-oriented. He's a physician. He's investigated. He said, for some time past, I've compiled this. I've, I've investigated this. So I'm going to write to you an account. So keep all of that in mind as we turn to chapter 9, verse 18. 
and says, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, that is Jesus, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. So, just a note, Christ means Messiah or anointed one. And at this time period, during the life of Jesus, everybody has this kind of anticipation. Everybody's looking for this promised heir, the Messiah, who was promised in the Old Testament, the son of David, who would set up the kingdom, who would sit on the throne forever. So they've confessed that Jesus is this Messiah that has been promised. And it goes on, it says, And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell, tell this to no one. He said, don't say anything to anybody. He didn't say, no, that's not true. He said, don't tell anybody this. Saying to them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Okay? So uh, he tells them, don't tell this to anybody because these things are going to happen. They have to happen. They must happen. Okay. And then uh, he continues on. And, and it's key to note here, prior to this time, they were alone. It was Jesus and his apostles. Excuse me. Um, so it was Jesus and the twelve. And uh, Jesus was praying. And then I know where he asked him this question. And they have a little talk about it. And then he tells them that these things are going to happen. And keep it quiet. And then it says, and he said to all. So uh, if we look at the other Gospels of Mark and Matthew, they both record this same interchange. Uh, there's different details in there, one of which is that they're at Caesarea Philippi. And uh, the other is that there was a crowd approaching them as the first part of this conversation took place. And now in verse 23, Luke acknowledges he's, that more have joined him. And it says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So now this greater group has joined them and he says, if you're going to follow me, and that means if you're going to, if you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow after me, uh, it's the same language used in the Old Testament when it says they followed after the, the strange gods, the other gods. They followed after Yahweh. Um, that kind of intense learning, trying to walk in a path, right? Walking away. So Jesus says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me and my way and my teaching, this is what's required. Let him deny himself. Um, be fully surrendered. And it says, uh, take up his cross. That is a very clear picture that we've talked about several times. Um, it would be like saying, be like the person walking down death row uh, to the electric chair, to the injection chamber. That's what you got to be like. The life you've lived up to this point is done. It's over. If you're going to follow me, you have to deny all those things that you had hopes for before, the living for yourself, all that has to be behind you. For whoever would save his life will lose it. If you pursue those things, you're not going to be my disciple. But whoever loses his life for my sake, so whoever gives up himself for my sake, will save it. Well, that seems counterintuitive, unless you put together what else is said about ourselves, right? So we have the benefit of full scripture, full 
revelation here in the writings that have been passed to us. We don't just have the Old Testament. So um, further in the Bible, we are told that we are dead in our trespass. We're already dead. We're already walking down that corridor to the electric chair. We just don't know it. Um, and if we continue to live our way, we will sit in the electric chair. But Jesus said he came to give us life abundantly. Right? So what, that's what he's saying. He's saying if you want to, to know true life, you will deny yourself and you'll follow after me. And then we see uh, this juxtaposition of Jesus, the Son of Man, who he says he is now, how he appears now. Um, if you are ashamed of me and what I teach now, when I return in my full glory, right? It says in his glory. So it's an allusion to his divine nature. He's fully man, fully God. And the glory of the Father. So he will also be glorified by the Father. And of the holy angels, the same glory that the angels experienced. I tell you truly, and uh, then it says, but I will tell you, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, some have mistakenly said that statement voids this. That uh, because Jesus didn't return in the lifetime of those apostles, uh, of those disciples standing there, that scripture is bunk. Well, it's wrong, and it's a wrong understanding of this passage. What it means is that those standing there are about to witness this change that has happened because Jesus has entered the world. And as he just told his disciples, these things are coming that the Messiah must do. Before he's glorified, these things are going to happen, right? The greater crowd doesn't know that. But that's what he's saying. And... What Jesus is saying is there are some standing here. Some might die before this happens, but people here are going to witness the coming of the kingdom. Now, we know the kingdom isn't fully here, but it has arrived. It's the here, not yet, right? So we're waiting for the completion of that, just like the sanctification of ourselves. We work daily believing that Jesus is going to complete the good work in us. We strive after him. We chase after him, right? So it's all those things. Now, we don't just stop here because the next part is tied to this, and we know that because it refers backwards to what we just read. Um, so we're going to continue on into verse 28. It says, Now, after eight days, uh, now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, his appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. So he's talking about Jesus. Suddenly, his face was changed. His clothing became dazzling white. So they went up a mountain. This is Mount Hermon. And, uh, and he's transformed. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. Or, or in the Greek, it says exodus, of his exodus, which was about to he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. So they were, they were drowsy, they were sleepy, they were maybe asleep. But when they had become fully awake, probably not fully asleep. They were drowsy, like when you're drifting off watching your TV, you know, um, not paying attention and not all there. They're in a fog. Um, when they fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And, the voice, and when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything that they had seen. So we have this, this last part of, of, of these events, and they're all tied together, at least in Luke's mind they are. So we have Jesus saying, who do you say I am? They confess him as Christ, the promised Messiah, the coming um, the coming 
king who's going to sit on the throne. And uh, Jesus knows that to them, that means a king who's going to conquer Rome and set up an earthly kingdom. And that's not what Jesus is about. So he corrects them and he says, look, don't tell anybody about this because these things are going to happen. Okay? Uh, he doesn't correct their misguided thoughts, but he, he, he immediately uh, clarifies what's going to happen to the Messiah. And he doesn't tell them they're wrong. In fact, he lets them know that they're right, but they need to keep it quiet because these things have to happen. They must happen. And then a group joins them, and Jesus teaches that if you're going to follow after me, you have to not be about yourself. You have to be about my business. Your life is now found in me and my purpose and my kingdom. And then he takes these three guys. Um, there are four disciples that are in Jesus' inner circle. They're the closest to him. That's Andrew, Peter, John, and James. Uh, those four always show up uh, at the front of the list when they're listed. Um, Peter is always first, and then these three follow, and then some other combination of the rest of the apostles. Um, these were the close people to Jesus, and it's two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and John and James. Now, Andrew's left out of this part, and this is just me surmising, but Andrew and elsewhere, uh, in John, it says that right before Jesus is baptized, um, Andrew was there, and as he approached, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God approaches. And uh, Andrew heard this. He heard that, and he has this interchange with Jesus, and then he goes home and tells Peter, Hey, you have to come with me. I found the Christ. you got to talk to him. I found the Messiah. So Andrew has already known who Jesus is. He's in the agreement in the confession earlier, because all the apostles were there. Um. I wonder if maybe that's why he wasn't included in this. Just a supposition, don't know for sure. So I'm not going to say there says the God, there, there says the Lord. <laughs> Rather, I'm going to say could be. I think maybe it's true. But we have Peter, John, and James who witness Jesus uh, suddenly transformed. And, and they see him in his glorified self, uh, his true state, uh, as fully man, fully God, and they see that. Wow, that's wonderful. Thanks, Chris. What does that mean for me? There's one word I'm going to tell you. There are, there are a few things I want you to remember this morning. So first, the first part that gripped me was, who do you say that I am? So if you get nothing else this morning, I want you to think heavily about um, Jesus asked his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? They'd heard of what all the crowds had said. They'd said that he's John the Baptist. They said he's Elijah. They said he's one of the other prophets. Today, it could be said that I've heard what Chris says, who you are. I've heard who Shay says you are, Lord. I have heard what Joel Olstein says. I've heard what Mohammed says about you. I've heard what uh, Donald Trump has said about you. And he said X, Y, and Z. But Jesus is still going to ask you. It's a question we all get asked. Who do you say I am? And it's the only one that matters. Because as we know later in Scripture, it says we have to believe in our hearts, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead. It's a personal understanding, a personal knowledge, a personal confession of faith that Jesus is the Messiah. He's this promised person who is fully man, fully God, able to pay for our sins and establish the kingdom of God. And we have to confess that alongside of the apostles. You are the Christ of God. And as a pastor, we spend a lot of time studying about what other people say. I read the Bible, I study the Bible, and then I go to people who know more than me, and I learn more about that, right? And uh, so I felt like this week Jesus was asking me, Chris, who do you say that I am? Sometimes we get lost in the weeds, and we get so consumed with learning more knowledge, more things. But all we need is this and the time we spend with God. 
to know who he is, to know it's true. It's not bad to learn more. But you're confronted with that question, and it's the question that is the most important one because it's the one that is going to define uh, what happens at the end of your life. Who do you say that Jesus is? It's famously uh, said by C.S. Lewis uh, that a lot of people call Jesus a good moral teacher. I have my, some of my best friends aren't Christians. And they say, I love Jesus' teaching. He's a good moral teacher. Uh, and like C.S. Lewis, I have to agree that Jesus didn't allow for that to be uh, a realistic picture of who he is. See, Jesus said he is God. He is the Christ. He is divine. He is human. He is all those things. Not just a moral teacher. He is the way, the truth, the life. Um, it's the only way to the Father. It's through Jesus. It is the only way to pay for our debt of sin is through Jesus. We can't pay it. We can't do it. And we can't be in relationship with God without Jesus. And so, C.S. Lewis said that that means one of three things. One, Jesus is a liar. That what he said isn't true. He knew it and he deceived people. And as such, he's not a good moral teacher. Two, he's a lunatic. He's crazy. He truly believed the things he said, but he was wrong. He wasn't the Son of God. He wasn't Christ incarnate. He wasn't the promised Messiah. He was none of those things. And therefore, he should be rejected because uh, he's a lunatic. He's crazy. He's mentally unstable. And he would not be a good moral teacher. Or three, three, um, he really is who he said he is. He is the Son of God. He is Christ incarnate. He is uh, fully God, fully man, he did come to pay for our sins. He did come to reconcile us to God. And, and that question, who am I? Who do you say that I am? Because Jesus isn't confused about who he is. He said it clearly, who he is. Who do you say that I am? Do you believe that? Is what he challenges us with. So this morning, we need to answer that question. Now, for those of us who are Christians, I was confronted with it as a reminder of quit getting in the weeds. You know, it's great to learn about all this stuff, but man, return to the simple truth that I am who I said I am, and you're in relationship with me, and I am your teacher. Which is awesome, and it's great, and I needed that so much. Um, sometimes I get sucked into the weeds. Uh, I can get really detail-oriented, I can go on rabbit trails, so for me, that was a really uh, important thing that gripped me this week. Now, if you're here and you haven't made Jesus uh, your Lord and Savior, if you don't know who he is, or you haven't confessed that yet, this is the most important question of your life. And I invite you to dwell heavily upon that um, and, and urge you to figure out who you say he is. Okay? Um, the second thing this morning is what we've talked about a lot here. Um, the, 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 uh, oh, sorry, before we move on. We, unlike the apostles, are not told to be silent. See, they were told to be silent because these things had not yet happened. That must happen. It wasn't time for the message to go out quite yet. Jesus still had ministry to do. He still had uh, opposition to face. He still had the cross ahead of him and the resurrection ahead of him. We share in the commission given to those at his, uh, his, his ascension. Go into the world and make disciples of them all. Go and be my witnesses. That is our job. So we're not to be quiet. We're to share what we know. And uh, the command to make disciples isn't just to, to, to preach to people, it's to, to teach them. It's not just a one-time encounter, it's to continually teach, kind of like what Luke is doing with Theophilus here. He's introduced him to the idea, now he's saying with certainty these are the things, and I want you to be a lifelong learner of what it means to follow Christ. And it's to point people to the Master, 
not to myself, but to the master. We're to be his witnesses. Okay, so the second thing I want you to take away from this morning, there's only three things. One, you got to answer the question, who do you say I am? Two, it's not about you. Jesus says, uh, if you're going to follow after me, uh, you can't continue to chase the desires of your heart, the sinful nature of your heart that, cha that had you chasing sex, money, uh, escape, entertainment. Not in it, that entertainment in itself is bad, but being obsessed with it is. Um, fame, fortune, whatever you can think of that you were pursuing out of sinful desire, out of greed, out of anger, out of lust, out of jealousy, out of envy, out of pride, out of idol idolatry, um, any of those things. That we, we can't continue to do that. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're really going to be his witnesses and his followers, if we're going to listen and learn and live in, a, in relationship with him, not just study the Bible like, like a textbook, but if we're going to truly know him and live with him and, and commune with him, then we must die to ourselves. We must say every morning, eh, the way I used to live, that ain't, that ain't how I'm going to live anymore. It's not living for me. I'm living for you. I'm living for your purpose. And what a tremendous gift it is to be invited in to the mission of Jesus. He's, he's not just asked us, he's commanded us to take up the banner and be his witnesses, to be his witnesses in the world. And that's not a hard job. It's not a hard job to say, hey, I was lost, but now I'm found. This is who I used to be, and this is who I am now, because Jesus and me, we know each other. And you can know him too, right? That's number two. And then number three, we need to be awake. Um, Peter, John, and James were invited to a very uh, important moment. And, and, and it's one that uh, that not, not every apostle got to see. Only three of them got to see Jesus glorified that way. And like in the Garden of Gethsemane, while Jesus is praying before he's taken, and uh, they are so like us, it's not even funny. They fell asleep. They're nodding off. They're, they're drifting in and out. While Jesus is praying, Jesus prays uh, awesome. He's always by himself. He prays, uh, you know, and he's so devoted. And, and yet, here we are trying to pray with him. Here they are with him, trying to pray with him. And they can't stay awake. And uh, that, that spoke to me a lot today uh, because last night I spent an hour trying to pray last night and I fell asleep in my bed praying. Um, and it happens quite often at nighttime. It's not my only time to pray because I often drift off asleep. And uh, I, I really relate to the apostles sometimes in this, in, in their failure. And it's failure. They, they were not able to stay awake. Um, so they missed out on part of what had happened. And only later were they able to understand what they had missed. Uh, you know, like when you wake up and you kind of were drifting off watching a TV program, and you kind of remember it, but then later you're like, oh, yeah, I understand what happened there. That's what they're going through. That's what's happening here. And uh, we have Moses, the lawgiver. We have Elijah, the, the leader of the prophets, the representative of the prophets, we have the law and the prophets, and we have Jesus. Now, we know that Jesus is above both the law and the prophets. He's better than both of those, right? He's what they talked about. He's the promised person coming. Um, Peter wakes up, and he's like, oh, this is awesome. My three favorite peeps are here, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. How awesome is that? And he said, and it says they turned to depart. They were leaving as G as Peter came out of his uh, of his his uh, stupor, his his sleep. Uh, he became fully awake, and he blurts out that we should make tents for each of you. Uh, look, don't let this go away. Stay, hang out. This is awesome. And there's his first mistake, uh, his second mistake rather. His first mistake was he wasn't able to stay awake, so he didn't get to experience the fullness of what was going on. Two, he equated Jesus on par with them, and that's not true. Uh, Jesus just asked them who he was, said he was Christ, 
but they understood the Messiah a little different than who Jesus actually is. And then in his discourse to the crowd, Jesus talks about his glory, the Father's glory, and that the angels uh, are reflected in that glory, right? They get to spend time in the presence of both those glories. Um, Jesus is divine. He talks about it, um, not blatantly, just like he talks in parables, but he talks about it. He talks about his glory alongside of the Father's glory, his divine glory. Um, Peter missed that part. The disciples, the apostles missed that part, right? Because John and James didn't pipe up. It's always Peter talking on behalf of them, and they all miss it. And because he equates them on this level, a cloud covers the mountain, just like when Moses was on, on the mountain and the, the tablets were delivered to him. The presence of the Father comes and hovers, or perhaps the Holy Spirit. And the voice of the Father says, this is my son. This is my son. Listen to him. Obey him, right? So, no, Peter, he's not on par with them. He's better than them. He is part of the Godhead. Listen and obey, right? Um, the third thing, though, I want you to remember this morning is be awake. Don't miss out on what God is doing. So many times I find that I miss the best things um, because I'm preoccupied with other things. I've said yes to good things or I've, I'm paying attention to something that, uh, you know, entertainment, like I said, isn't bad. But if we can get consumed with it, it takes our minds away, right? We don't think well uh, if we're constantly worrying about entertaining ourselves. Sometimes we don't like to just sit in silence. Uh, I think that's a really hard thing for us today. Um, but in silence, we can hear God more clearly. So don't neglect being awake. Struggle against the sleep that tries to pull you down in this world. Um, that's part of being different than the world. Uh, we're supposed to be here and be a witness. But we also need to be awake to what God is doing around us. So we don't miss out on opportunities. God's will is going to be accomplished. God is not bound by me and you doing the right things. So there's a relief. You're, you're not going to hinder God. However, you're going to miss out on the mission. And in your disobedience, you'll have to answer for that. So don't be asleep. Now, um, I'm going to share a story about my wife and... Uh, I don't think she'll mind, even though she felt silly at the time. It, it's, a, it's a really good example. And, and I don't know how many times, and it's a good example. It's a good example of being awake. Whereas I'm often not awake. Uh, I, I often don't listen to that voice when I ought to. So my wife, the other day, was at the store. She was shopping for stuff at the store. Um, she was gone for a while. I was at home with the kids, taking care of them. And uh, doing schoolwork and stuff, she said, I want to run out. I want to go shopping. She likes to get away and, and do shopping, even if it's just for groceries. It, uh, for her, it's a moment of clarity. It's, it's, it's that quietness. It's that time to just chill. Um, and, and, you know, in her job as a physician, she has a high-intensity job. She works in the operating room um, as an anesthesiologist. So her job is pretty intense. So those moments where she can decompress, I like to give to her because she needs it. So she went to the store and, uh, you know, she was picking out stuff for our, our weekly meals or whatever. And uh, she came home about an hour later. And we were only getting a few things. So I, she was gone for a while. And I was like, that's kind of weird, but okay, whatever. She came back with Starbucks for me, you know, coffee. So I was happy. Um, and she had this sheepish look on her face as she carried in the bags and I helped carry in some. And she kept holding this one bag, and she held it behind her back, and she went. She, she was embarrassed. And I said, "Well, what's up? Like, what's going on?" And she said, "Look, I bought this, and I don't know why I bought this." And she puts down uh, out of the bag a pack of diapers, size four diapers, very specific size four diapers. And um, I looked at her. Uh, and said, is, are you trying to tell me something? Like, are, are we expecting? And she was like, no, 
no, and I feel dumb for buying them. I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, I was standing there and I felt like I had to buy these and I don't know why. And I said, no, I'm being dumb. I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to buy them. And she started to walk away and she felt the overwhelming need to go back. And she said, no, no, I can't do this. She did this four times. She said four times she went, tried to walk away and she couldn't have any peace walking away from it. So she bought them. And she's like, I don't know why I bought them. I just felt like I had to do it. And I said, well, that's a good thing. I was, I was so proud of her because so often I ignore that. I'm so asleep that I miss it. She was awake. In that moment, she was listening to what God was saying. And you're like, Chris, it's diapers. But trust me, uh, I was like, okay, God put something on your heart. Let's find out why. So uh, I asked her, I was like, do you know anybody? has a baby that needs size four diapers that does anybody have a baby that age that you know at the moment um, that might be in need She's like, no I don't I don't know anybody in, in that that would need those diapers that I am aware of that I knew of and I said okay I said well let let's ask pastor Shay if he knows anybody and he didn't he was like no I don't know anybody off the top of my head I don't have anything on my heart about that I said okay and then, uh, this was all the same day, within an hour, um, I was sitting there on Facebook. She had forgotten about the diapers. I'd forgotten about the diapers. And then uh, Chris Alford, um, the head of the Sullivan Baptist Association, which is uh, the Baptist Association here where we're at, um, he shared about his Venezuela project because his parents are missionaries in Venezuela. He, uh, he lived there a lot when he was a child. He has a heart for that. And uh, they're gathering supplies and materials because if you've heard anything on the news about Venezuela, things are really bad there. And they have a way to get supplies in where the UN is having trouble delivering food and diapers and all those things. And right there at the top said diapers needed. And I said, that's it. God wants us to contribute to this. This was him plucking at Kelly's heart saying, hey, I have something that I want you to be a part of. Are you going to be a part of it? Are you awake enough to hear it? She was. And then he tugged on me and he said, this is it. This is the thing. I said, okay, God. So we took those diapers and then we went to the store because we weren't just going to drop off diapers when they need a whole lot more. We bought a bunch of ramen, some canned uh, beans and all the stuff that they had on the list. We bought as much of it as we could and we took it and dropped it off at the church. And uh, I don't say that to brag, but rather to show you that God is at work all around us all the time. And so often we miss it because we're sleepy. Don't be sleepy. Be awake. Be aware of what's going on. And then, uh, you know, it comes in, comes in little pieces because we're not always awake. So we, we awaken in this, this dumbfounded state like Peter. And we don't understand necessarily everything that's going on. But you got to love Peter. He's a man of action. He always leaned into his inclination. Something important is happening here. Let's prolong it. That sounds good. It's not what God wanted, and uh, he found out about that. But he leaned into it, and that served him well later. He, he, he was their leader. He, he constantly prompted them into action, the apostles. And that's good. So this morning, I want you to remember, we all have to answer the question, who do you say that I am? And it's an important question. If you haven't ever answered that, you need to answer it. Because one day you're going to stand before God and you will know who he is and it'll be too late. Two, that to follow Jesus means to follow him fully, surrender. It means we're not pursuing our agenda anymore. We are now pursuing his. We need to give up everything if it's asked of us. That means I'm not pursuing wealth, but I'm pursuing his mission. Now, that may mean that he blesses me in the, in the short term, but if he blesses me, it's also to accomplish his mission, right? Um, the things that I have are not my own. They are to be used for God's kingdom. My kingdom is not important, only his. And then three, be awake to what is happening around you. Be awake to God's movement and prompting about you so you don't miss out. 
uh, that's what I have for this morning. I don't want to, to just leave it hanging, though. So I'm going to invite you guys to do something a little different. I'm going to invite you to right now close your eyes. In fact, I want everybody to close your eyes and bow your heads. Um, I'm not there to do an altar call. Not there to invite you up front and pray for you up front. So what I'm going to do is have you bow your heads, close your eyes. And then I'm going to ask you right now, if this morning you're being confronted with the question, who do you say I am? And you need some correction in that. Or you need to make that decision. Raise your hand right now. And if this morning you've been failing at living with Jesus' agenda first, if you have failed to take up your cross today, if you failed this week to pick up your cross and live for Jesus and for Jesus alone, to die to yourself, raise your hand. Don't look around, just raise your hand, keep your eyes closed, your head bowed. And then lastly, if you are guilty of being asleep, of falling asleep and not catching all the things that God is doing around you, raise your hand. Now, my hunch is, even though I'm not there, even though I can't see you, that all of us are raising our hands right now. I know I am. You may put your hands down, but keep your head bowed. I invite you to pray with me this morning as we close up. Lord, Father God, you are so wonderful, so great that you have sent Jesus for us. Lord, we are in sin. We know that. You've told us that. We understand that we are sinful creatures. Lord, I'm going to invite those who have not yet confessed Jesus, if they so feel led, if they know in their hearts, if they can say that Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Christ, he truly did come and die for my sin. If he was raised from the dead, and he now reigns as Lord, and I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I'm going to invite them right now to confess that to you, God, that I am sinful and I am in desperate need of saving. I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live for you. I want to pursue your agenda. Lord, I need Jesus to save me. And if this morning you have been failing at putting Jesus' agenda first, the kingdom of God first, if you have uh, failed to die to yourself today, this week, this month, this year, I invite you right now to pray with me and confess that sin. God, I have fallen short this morning, this week, this month, this year. God, I am selfish. I am wretched. I am sinful, Lord. And I'm so thankful that you sent Jesus to save me from this. God, change my heart. Give me the strength to live for you. To live with your agenda first. To live with others' purpose first. With your purpose first and foremost, Lord. Help me to be last. Help me to be a servant. Help me to be your witness, God as you've called me to be. Lord, help me to change from here forward to live with you first. And remind me constantly, because I constantly forget. My sinful heart still breaks through and grips me. Lord, please change me from the inside out. And lastly, if you have been sleepy, you love God, you love Jesus, you love to put him first, but we so desperately fail sometimes to see what he's doing, to hear his call, to hear the promptings, or sometimes we just plain ignore him. I invite you to pray with me now. Lord, I have failed you. I have fallen asleep. I have not been a 
attentive to what you are calling me to, God. Lord, help me to see with spiritual eyes what is going on around me, to hear your voice, to hear you in my heart, to hear you tugging at me to your purpose, to your will, to your kingdom work. Lord, all of us in this room are here because we want to know you more. Some of us may have not confessed or know that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that he died for our sins, that he was resurrected, and that he now reigns, that he was fully God and fully man, that he was divine, uh, that he was God incarnate, and that he walked in our shoes. God, I ask that you would convict them this morning that you would open their hearts to your truth, God. Lord, if there are those here this morning that have confessed that, God, I praise you for that. I praise you for everybody here who already is a believer, God. Your work is so wonderful. Your kingdom is awesome, Lord, and we celebrate that. God, I thank you for inviting us on your journey. Lord, I hope that all these hearts have been open to your message this morning, that I have been a yielded vessel to you, that I have spoke your word. God, I pray that you would put blessings upon those here this morning as they go out and seek to do your will, to die to themselves, to pursue you this week. God, it's in Jesus' name we pray.